Guys, welcome back to the Charles Owen experience. Mate, Owen so experience. Good. I mean. The Owen, Charles, Charles, Charles. Yo, Charles, what's up, Charles, man? Charles. It's really good to see you back. Thanks, man. That's my leg. Shout out BJJ Focus Camps. What are you doing there? Oh, yeah. What's that about? Give good, us a bit good reminder. Details. I yeah. was going to leave that till about halfway through. But basically, me and Jason Rao, right? We are going to be good. doing... He's good. He's fucking good. In fact, even if I'm shit, just go there for Jason Rao. That's why I'm going. Like, yeah. Obviously, I'm getting paid on that. But yeah, yeah. I'm going there just to learn off Jason Rao. And like... What's the date? uh fuck mate it's somewhere in june it's 14th of june to like 19th something like that me jason rao and it's going to be a lot of k-guard so if you're into that sort of stuff i am i'll be there i am let me tell you I'll i am there, yeah. k-guard is the cheapest way to get entries on bigger fellas and i'm sure jason rao has some stuff to show that you will have never seen before and me i will just condense stolen stuff so you know it's going to be worth it where's it's it gonna where's it going to be chief living sorry L Leuven. I think I'm pronouncing that perfectly, actually. Where is that? Leuven. It's in Belgium. Got it. Guys, remember, like, subscribe, YouTube, Spotify, do all that. If you're listening on Spotify, top right-hand corner. Mm. Do that now. Click, mm. rate, and subscribe. YouTube, subscribe. Really tasty. We're raking to, it in. We I need to sort ready. out the YouTube. You know what I need to do? I need to upload the video and then wait before it publishes and then I can request review because we're just not when it, the monetization is just going yellow every time limited monetization why maybe swearing or something something's happened and every time I post it it doesn't want to get monetized really but what will happen is I'll request review then it'll go green and then it will you've just you've lost all the views the main views have happened before I, the request has been granted ah, I see so basically so they just auto out, demonetize it seems like that. Shout out Limmy, less impressive, more involved. He told me, he, he told me this specifically and I ignored him, that when you go to <laughs> upload, don't put it private first or unlisted and then you can request review, etc. Yeah, that's the, right. that's the back end details, guys. That's the back end yeah. details. Because we have not been raking it in actually, in actual real life. No. We have not been raking it. But I suppose not that's fair. YouTube, low budget, YouTube. low skill, low information low profit it will come time will tell we get a lot of youtube views compared to some other guys who have like big podcasts we really we, yeah we we smash them david gray podcast gets terrible viewing views yeah. on youtube we smoke him same with some other famous podcasters we, yeah. smoke, we smoke them out maybe we should just start doing dumb shit so you know it's less jujitsu and more just like you know what it is mate I we need know. to get back to those technique breakdowns that did very well mm. and <laughs> <laughs> oh wait mm, mm, mm. honestly it's that will build this youtube channel right and then our podcast will become better and better better because better, we get more viewers better. and they go oh and what's then this ask about? better questions yeah. yeah it's all on the viewers right basically we need to do the technique breakdowns guys remember if you want a technique breakdown done send your match requests in the comments yeah it's got to be a good match you know like a gordon thingy one more so than uh, the Elijah run because the Elijah run wasn't, you know, we, that we, groundbreaking. We, we listened to them too. We listened to one stupid comment, which was like, "Oh, you've done Gordon Ryan. He's the best. He's the best of all time for for a reason." Yeah, because it's, it's his different. technique is yeah. very good. Dante yeah. Leon Di Diego Pato matches is, is coming up, so we there could be some good technique details on that. We could just break down any of Diego's matches, and I'm sure there'd be some quality things to see. No doubt. Pato. So what's been happening? You're back. We're back from Q8. That was yeah. a great trip. That was back. Kind of kind of wasn't ill and then was ill and then wasn't ill and was ill. So I, now I'm just going to take it very easy until I feel I have a 100% bill of health. That said, I did feel like I had a 100% bill of health. What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> did you just cut one? Uh, <laughs> Tuesday, but then today woke up not feeling that great. So I don't know what the fuck's going on. Maybe I've got long AIDS. Is that a thing? Long COVID. It's like, yeah, like long COVID, but it's when you have AIDS instead. Shout out Dallas Buyers Club. I you, love that you, film. You look awful. You actually look awful. You do. I actually feel great. Shout out. Shout Wait, was good today. Great. We've changed a few, thing, a few things around. We're following what's called hypertrophy mm. cluster sets. Shout mm. out Jake Tura for this. I like Jake Tura's stuff that he puts out. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy his hypertrophy cluster. Um program and i'm just gonna do it i'm gonna do it so it consists of if you just follow his basic program it's gonna be like four days uh, uh, sorry if you just follow the program word for word it's gonna be like three or four days upper lower upper lower 
obviously we're lifting two times per week. So I'm just condensing it down a little bit more. So it consists of high reps, low, oh, sorry, low reps, high sets. So we're going to work on eight sets of five with 45 seconds to 90 seconds rest in between, which allows us to lift heavy, but not so crazy heavy that we can keep good intensity into our workouts with the goal of building muscle and also developing speed power because we're moving the weights fast because it's easier a little bit a little bit easier yeah and it's fine but ultimately if you break it down it's going to be similar to the same time period that you do four sets of eight to ten in so it's just a different way of mixing the program up i'm really excited to see it how it goes with us i'm doing it as well we'll do it for about 12 weeks or so maybe more and then if all is good and we get great results then i'll be moving that out to the to the masses we're the guinea pigs some of the masses yeah all right then shall we do some questions yeah that's it all right i've got some great questions thank you everyone who wrote in thanks guys yeah really good of you to write in so oh fuck what is this trust don't trust uh, do you want me to go you you can go how important is glucose for supplementing performance when and god how important is glucose for supplementing performance and when rehydrating well you don't have to have glucose present when rehydrating that's what that's what i've made electrolyte tablets however it's helpful um oh, i don't like that i hope that doesn't do anything to the audio chief nah, it seems yeah, right. no seems all right just my go. phone um what was I talking about hydration no you just you as long as you've got just basically if you take a, a rehydration tablet that is going to be a fantastic way to get yourself hydrated because it's going to have sodium, potassium, magnesium, and a whole bunch of other stuff in there, which is clinically formulated to, scientifically formulated to rehydrate you as quickly as possible. You could also do that if you don't have those tablets with like an isotonic sport drink, like a Lucasade, Powerade, Gatorade, what you have. Big, they do big have, science. Huh? Big science. Big science. They, they do, want you to they buy do, it, the The glucose will speed up the rate of hydration in those with those sports drinks however they pale in comparison to an electro, uh, electrolyte tablets but they're also very good so uh in terms of glucose supplementing for performance and rehydrating so performance wise i mean yeah glucose is just sugar 30 to 90 grams of carbohydrates before you do training is a great idea to do build okay. yourself start 30 build yourself up to 90 train the gut we know that's absolutely key. Train the gut. Yeah, well, I mean, some people will be like, I can't eat before I get I go to training. Well, it's like, well, just start with something small and then try and get more and more each time and then more. depending more. on how hard you're training. Yeah. I mean, if you're an office worker, it doesn't really matter too much. But like, you could just get yeah. away with like banana. But if you're an athlete, you should be hitting the upper limits of 90 grams before training. Damn. Well, that's quite a lot. And it can be very hor- horrible training when you were very full. Mm-hmm. But I guess it's, a necessary evil. It depend. You just got to be clever with the, the the carb you're having, so you're not too full. It's not like mm, punishing on the stomach, crushing you inside. Mate, this is freaking me out every time you do. It's this, fine, mate. mate. It's fine. Honestly, it's working. It's working, and it's not even charging my phone, which is the best part. That's the best part. Right, All right, cool. On. Let's do a question. How to deal with a partner sprawling in your half butterfly? So, if you have the butterfly hook in, you should use that to elevate them up your up your body and then invert to get the legs so basically if they have if you have a half butterfly and they start to sprawl on you they should basically remove the half butterfly hook before they start to sprawl on you because otherwise they are basically giving you an elevation right so yeah when you do the sprawl passing you want to do it against the knees not against the butterfly hooks if you just if you just sprawl on a hook that's kind of what they want they're going to give you you're going to give them a you know, a nice entry into the legs, a nice little entry into the legs. So it's uh, much safer to basically take the hook out first and then sprawl. So if your half butterfly is getting sprawled on, it means there's something wrong with your knee positioning, basically. Chum. All right. Uh, that's my answer in Sterling. What were you saying yesterday good about one, knee separation, when to go, etc. That was a good detail to talk about. Oh, uh, with the sprawl passing. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, so yeah, that was just like, Oh, I call calling it sprawl passing. It's like camping from a, a split stance. So basically, watch the Dima video. Sometimes they have crossed legs. Sometimes they push you away with their, with their knees. And sometimes they have like uh, one knee close to their chest and one knee far away, like a, like a sort of diagonal knee shield. I don't know what to call that. Like one knee really high, close to their shoulder and one knee 
like close to you so it's hard for you to put your head down because their knees there and it's hard for you to sprawl because their knees high up so that's when you just press your knee to the floor and then you've kind of already got your knee close to their hip so that's like halfway past and at that point they're either going to push you or they're going to self-frame uh and try to invert and if you have like uh, if you're ready for both of those, then you can basically take advantage of it. Maybe we'll do a technique tip, but I don't want to bastardize something that someone else has shown basically. So I'm going to work Dana. on it a bit longer yeah. until I get some concrete stuff where I'm like, okay, I've tried this on the best people. These are the reactions that I always get. And I'm pretty confident that this is a fact before I show it basically as a fact. Fair play as a true yeah. martial artist would do. Yeah, mate. I want to be, you know, con a true you know precise with what I'm showing. Yeah. Best practice to retain BJJ progressions and moves. Mate, you should listen to our last podcast. Go listen to the previous podcast. Retaining. This. Stefan does a great job breaking down the ins and outs of retaining information and it, semen. And se yeah, it's really <laughs> excellent. Really little segment. Really impressive. Yeah. Go listen to the last episode. Um, you go, Chief. You All go. right, then. Okay. Best way to create pressure and force engagement when seated against a standing opponent. So get legs what yeah try to basically butt scoot towards your partner not too aggressively because then they start to jump around your guard and that so try to scoot forward and then cut angles around your partner and then if they're still being negative th there's no harm in standing up and pulling guard again or like half standing up and pulling guard again uh if someone's like standing and actively running away you can hopefully assume that there's a referee right if they like and there's some sort of penalty system. So most matches, there's a penalty system. So if you just keep scooting towards someone and they don't engage, then you, and there's no penalty system, then you should stand up like fake wrestle to a guard pull. And then you can use your guard pull to get grips so that when you land supine, your partner doesn't disengage from you again. If you think like most of the leg lock entries or most of the leg locking guards, you will be on your back, right? So by staying seated the whole time, it makes it very difficult for you to enter the legs. But generally, if you stay seated long enough to get grips and then pull yourself into a good supine guard, that is how you get effective entries upon the legs. So got to remember that, right? Seated is good for like, cause you're closer to standing up and you have more momentum to pull your partner backwards. But if you stay seated the whole time and you never commit to pulling them into a supine guard, you will never go anywhere. Great Thanks. analysis. Fantastic. All right, I'll go for the next one then, seeing your phone's just broken, smashed I've got to one. pieces. I've got one. Go on, go on, go on. Try. Most essential equipment for a home gym. Do you in smell your, that, by in the your way? Opinion. Huh? It smells a lot like burning. Uh, uh, man, we hate cigarettes. Uh, they're so awful. actually delicious. Awful martial artist. Yeah. Most essential equipment for a home gym, in your opinion, be just your athlete. Um, get yourself a barbell. Get yourself enough weights. That's going to be good enough for you to lift. The weights will be the most expensive part, the weight plates. Uh, get yourself some kettlebells. Uh, I would say either some pairs or just single ones if you just want to practice swings and cleans. It depends what you got, mate. I mean, if you, if you, have, if you have space for a rack with a pull-up bar, a rack with a pull-up bar would be excellent, a bench, a barbell, weights, and then some adjustable dumbbells. That would be my go-to, mate. Fair that's mate. it. And that's it. And make sure you have enough space so you can do some jumps. Jumping. And you're good. Oh, and then a cable machine and then, you know, a belt squat machine and a... What 2.5 to 50 kilo dumbbells? GHD. GHD. How key is the GHD? I love a GHD. Fucking love it. If it's a home gym, it depends how much you like a GHD, glute, glute hamstring developer. I fucking love them. I'd have it. Is that what it stands for? Glute hamstring developer. Who yeah. knew? Break Henry David. GHD. No one knows. Take it away. Good for abs as well, no? If you just yeah. flip, flip yourself over. Fucking good for abs in the spine. What? <laughs> What are your favorite ways to defend against the full sweep once the grips and legs are fully in place? Oh, you love this so You have question. to deconstruct that. So probably the grips are going to be hardest to deconstruct if they have like a full uh, figure four grip. Not a figure four. Yeah, figure four. What's it called? Like a rear naked choke grip on your leg. You basically have to try to backstep past both of your partner's legs. If you just backstep past one and they still have the inside hook, they're still going to get your leg. So you have to backstep past both of the legs. And then once you do that, you can block their face from coming in between your legs and then you can shimmy your chest over the top of their knee and only once their knee is like past your center line or on your center line can you start to sprawl i would watch an ethan krellenstein little bit on that he does a basically it just does that but on video 
yeah that's that's how i do it try to back is this on youtube the ethan krellenstein yeah if you just type in ethan krellenstein full sweep defense i'm sure it will come up i mean i'm not 100 percent sure but just keep searching and you're gonna find it it's a b-team video <laughs> you're gonna find them you're gonna find it all right, all right that's yeah. it that's it thoughts of the butt wink uh the butt I wink is essentially when you're doing a squat and you'll see the hips get tucked underneath I don't think it's particularly a bad thing. It's just flexion of the spine. Depends how pronounced it is. If it's really pronounced, then I'll be like, okay, may maybe we'll put some uh, weight plates underneath your heels so we can get a little bit more ankle uh, dorsiflexion and see if that changes. Uh, I would work on some eccentrics to slow down the, the rate at which we're moving to try and you know iron out that crease, so to speak. I'll try adding in some pauses. Um or maybe moving to a Zercher squat or a front squat variation, or just tried some different variations to see whether the aggressiveness of the butt, butt wink decreases or increases. So I have a play around with it. Again, getting a bit of spinal flexion at the end of the squat is completely fine. No problem with that. A really big pronounced butt wink, you're probably better off swapping to a different squat variation, whether it's a front squat, back squat, Zercher. Even if it feels good, if it feels good, it feels keep, good. Keep do doing it. it. Yeah, keep doing it. That's the rule. Just go nice and steady. If it's not painful, no problem. Add some eccentric work in. Add some pause work in. Make sure you're doing some single leg work as well. And that's your answer. But the spine is meant to flex. The spine can flex. It's not a problem. It's not. A, it's not a chicken from. All right. Could you recommend some butterfly guard instructionals, please? Well, if you want half of one, you can get mine. If you want full butterfly guard, I would recommend Gordon Ryan's seated guard instructional sick right how to avoid das and anacondas from half butterfly so shout out sandra you got to keep that left knee high up and you also have to be pretty aware let's say you're playing on your right hand side sorry you've got to keep your left knee higher up and then let's say you go to put your butterfly hook in the left knee can no longer be trusted to block your whole partner so you know because it's not on their shoulder anymore it's tucked in so it'll be right around their ribs so they will technically be able to lean forward right put their chest kind of their head over your head and start to shoot the darces and the anacondas but as long as you keep your elbow tucked to your ribs like let's say you're playing on your right hand side if you keep your elbow open you can get caught if you close that elbow it's going to be very tough for them to catch you with like quickly you know so as they're feeding it in you can close your elbow and you can even use that to like bait them right so you can keep your elbow open and then you can bait them to try to shoot in a dart or something like that. And then as they do that, you can use your butterfly hook to elevate them over the top of you whilst tucking your elbow in. And either they're going to face plant or they're going to post their hand that they were using to try to like front headlock you. And then in that moment is when their legs will be light and you can attack the legs. Fucking lovely. You'd love uh, it that, don't you? Yeah, do have a video of that. Shout out Sandro. Uh, Doing it to Sandro, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, brother. Sorry, brother. Sorry, brother. All right. How do you approach... Deloading for grapplers. I don't deload grapplers particularly. If they've got a build up to a competition, the week of competition is when we're gonna go lighter. So you're gonna drop the volume, meaning sets and reps, and drop the intensity because you're not gonna make any gains in that in that week. So if you're gonna go to the gym, I'll just move for the first, I, I'll just go in there to move and feel really good through the movements, working about a seven out of 10 uh for one or two days of that week and then you're just going to rest and recover again you're not going to make any gains so there's no point in pushing it just go into the, either don't go to the gym or just go to the gym and feel nice and then on the flip side of that on the after you finish competition on the week that's when again i'll just slowly build back up again we don't you don't need to absolutely smash it uh you could just go you know seven seven to eight rpe and then build up again but to answer the main question i don't I don't do deloads. Most of your sessions as a grappler anyway, you should just be going into the gym to work at around the seven to nine RPE. If you feel really good, push the limits. If you don't, then still work at it like a seven to, seven to nine RPE, which will just be a lighter intensity because if you're really tired, you're still gonna work at that intensity, but everything will just be a bit lighter, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. So you don't actually need to do deloads unless you're an advanced olympic lifter or an advanced power lifter i just don't see why you would have to do a deload every now and then on my mat strong programs i change the program every four weeks because it's a program for the masses and it's just more fun when you do that you don't have to do things that way but it, for, for a program for the masses it just makes it more fun different varieties and you'll still get excellent gains doing so fair play but no deloads 
No, you've, to got, you've got you've got to auto regulate that. If you if you if you're building up your training and you're like, man, I'm feeling really tired. Great, then you can change some exercise variations, yeah. which will naturally, as you're change, changing your exercise variations, you're going to be lifting a little bit lighter anyway because you're not going to go into a different exercise, guns blazing. So that's another way of deloading your training just by changing some exercise variations or some reps and set schemes. So again, you don't have to do the classical deload. You could just change variations and then continue carrying on that way. I guess unless you're trying really hard, like, at, like scheduling in a deload week is just basically not training. Work. Yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, we'll go in and work at 50% or 60, 60 Just 60 wasting percent. time, basically. Yeah, just going through movement patterns, going through the movements, making them feel good. For a power lifter, an Olympic weightlifter with like a really, like a scheduled program, that could be, that yeah. that's probably makes more sense. You're probably you're not working hard lifter. enough to justify that. For jiu-jitsu athletes, n- no. You, you, you're not working hard enough in the, like, you work hard in the gym, but you don't, you shouldn't need to have a scheduled deload. Yeah. Even yeah, if you're training like one. three days a week, you don't need to schedule it in. Just yeah. if you feel tired, then just go lighter for that week. Yeah. That's it. But or don't again, schedule it. You can't be like, I'm going to be tired this week. So yeah, yeah, you don't go, oh, I'm going to ramp up 12 weeks. And at the end of the 12 weeks, I'm going to cut it off because not everything's perfect. You may have this perfect plan mm. for 12 weeks. And then you know what? You get sick. You get sick on week eight. And Great, everything's greatest fucking plans of mice and men. Am I right, Char? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, fucking brilliant that is. yeah brilliant love that film love bouncing dogs off the floor shout out Lenny yeah. what to do when body lock passing when people just two hand push on your head so if it's kind of too late and they, they start double rape choking you then it's too late right but if you can keep your head in the center right under their chin it's actually very hard to push down from under your chin so if you keep your head in the correct position like in it their is. center line pressing into them initially it's very hard to push down like just try it anyway just Put your head in the center of your partner's chest, close to their chin. Ask your partner to push your head down and they will not have a good grip. It's going to be like a tricep extension. Like, you know, it's hard to do like like that. They won't be able to hear you. But it's easy to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's like a dip compared to a tricep pull down. You can do way more on the tricep, on the dip. Yeah. So keep your head right in the center and high up their body and then they won't have like the space to to get a good like press with their, with their what would you say dips are like chest? Yeah, it's going to be yeah, deep range. Yeah. Like, if you're in this position, it's yeah. going to be fucking hard. Yeah. Like, if you're in that position as well, yeah. it's going to be fucking... Basically, any short range push is, is is tough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So try to make sure that it's a short range push. If you find that someone starts to, like, push your face every time, then you need to, like, preemptively stop that because, I mean, it is effective. You can see Gordon Ryan using it against Nicky Rod, just double pushing on his face, and Nicky's like, oh, you know... It's very uncomfortable, yeah. Yeah, it's super uncomfortable. And, like, the longer you stay there, you just realize I'm getting more tired than they are. They're just pushing my face, and, you know, you could hold it potentially, but you're just going to get more tired. So mm. better to go again. Fair play. Just go again. Great question. Intermittent fasting, long-term, okay for BJJ athletes? Uh, I don't think it is. I think intermittent fasting is an absolute fucking waste of time. Uh, well, because, especially because the question was geared for BJJ athletes. And if you're an athlete, th- your schedule is going to be, should be eat, train, eat and recover, train, yeah. eat and recover, train, train, eat and recover, train, sleep, right? Ooh. And if you're intermittent fasting between that, you're not fueling for the work required. And then you're just going to be under in calories, probably under in protein. And you're fucked. Then you just you you will get sick, and you will get run yeah. down, and everything's a waste of time. Intermittent fasting basically has fuck all benefits as well. It's just it it, it won't do anything for you, if, especially if you're a jiu-jitsu athlete and you need to train hard. If you need to train hard, you have to fuel properly for the mm. work required. It's just easier not to eat in the morning. It's, it's just like you can wake up a bit later and you can't be fucked to make breakfast. But for sure. honestly, you you are going to be better if you eat breakfast. 100%. Your life will be better. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it's it's like, oh, I just want to eat till one o'clock every day. That that has no benefit on you. An eight, an eight hour eating window for an athlete is, a f- it's just a foolish idea to do. You, you want to wait that 48 hours for autophagy if you're going <laughs> to mention that as well. So yeah. good luck to you, my friend. Yeah. Basically, uh, if you're a, if you're just a normal person and you're not an athlete and you're a hobbyist and you, and you want to do intermittent fasting for whatever reason, because it, like I said, it literally has fuck all benefits, then go for it. See if you like it. (laughs) Take that. Take that. Whatever Japanese wanker invented autophagy. (laughs) All right. Getting out of the cloverleaf leg entanglement. 
Uh, I'm pretty about? sure you got to just turn as if you were escaping normal saddle. And then you can basically hand fight. But as long as you pressure your feet towards the floor, it's very hard for them to finish. Like if you turn, let's say they have your, well, they have both legs, but let's say they have a clover leaf and they're on your right. If you just turn to your left, they won't get the finishing pressure to finish. And, and then it's just like, they can try to hold on, but basically you can just start to extract your, your legs. Uh, so yeah, just turn as if you're escaping saddle normally and they will struggle to get any finishing pressure. If you wait too long and your primary leg is straight, then it can become a problem. But as long as you have some give in your primary leg and you don't have like shin splints or whatever, you should be all right to just turn. Right. That was it. Do certain body types co- correlate with certain BJJ games? Um, yeah, I mean, look, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a longer person, you're probably going to have a different kind of game to a shorter person, right? Mm. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Don't know about that one. It's hard to tell, really. I would say, yeah. I'll give you some info on body types. It's called a wide RSA, wide IS, ISA, and a narrow ISA. Check out Greg Hawthorne archetypes. Or if you just type in body archetypes, ISAs, into YouTubes. I can't remember what ISA stands for. Basically, it's the ribs. If you have a wider ribs, wider rib cage, generally you're going to be a bigger person. If you have a more narrow rib cage, you're going to be more of a a taller, more upright person, leaner person, which is going to be probably more springy than the the wider person. It's going to be more powerful and forceful. I guess like in terms of passing, if you're very, if you've got chunky legs, it probably is going to favor like pressure passing more like putting your weight on your partner and then if you have like skinny little legs you you know you'll be able to move them around a bit quicker so maybe running around the outside makes a bit more sense but i feel like it's more about your personality and what you enjoy than your body type because you see people make passing different styles work with different body types it's not like like you couldn't say that oh it's better to be tall when you're leg locking because there's loads of great short leg lockers and and vice versa maybe like Diego Pato, yeah he's he's short maybe it's harder for him to like maintain the knee line or like to get as deep on entries, but he gets his feet on the inside easier because the, his legs are shorter. So, you know, there's positives and negatives to all body types. And as long as you make it work for your body type, that's the key. Fair play. Yeah. When you're doing more seminars in the UK, literally all the time, uh, I like... Just whenever someone messages me, I do a seminar if they're willing to pay the price. Of oh, 40 pounds. It's 40 pounds. It's 35 pounds now for a oh, seven great. hour seminar. Yeah. You want to go again, Chief? Are you happy with that? Cool. I'll go again. Keep getting stuck under fuckers who kneel when I invert from reverse De La Hiva. Oh, what yeah. should I do? We get a lot of reverse De La Hiva questions every week. So I think if they're kneeling from reverse De La Hiva, it means that you didn't really control their leg properly, right? Like if you think reverse De La Hiva, you have the hook in and you have their foot. If you don't have their foot, then it's just kind of like a knee shield. So probably it's that you're not really controlling their reverse De La Hiva leg properly. And then they're managing to sort of bring it back and sprawl under you as you go. So you need to get good control of that foot. So they're not able to pressure their knee forward. Like if, you know, basically if you control someone's heel, they can't sprawl. So that's the key. You have to make space, push your partner away whilst pulling their leg towards you and then they can't sprawl and then you have space to spin through or, you know, off balance them backwards. That's that's the rules. Reverse De La Hiva. You allowed to say that anymore? No, because he's a rapist, isn't he? <laughs> Wasn't he a rapist or something? Was he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Tell I that. personally experienced it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, for me, him. me too, yeah. Yeah, me too, sharp. Yeah, I can't complain though. Do you have any nutritional tips? I'm a pre-diabetic and can't Load a lot of carbs three times per day. Uh, blueberries and cacao? Huh? Blueberries and cacao? All you got to do is get matcha tea, organic grass-fed beef. That actually works really well. Organic butter. Uh, joke aside, if you're pre-diabetic, I mean, I'm not an, a clinical nutritionist, but I'm pretty sure you have to be fair, get, tipping on the point of being fairly overweight to be pre-diabetic. So my main recommendation to you would be- What just, about Nicky Rod? He's pre-diabetic, isn't he? Is he? Yeah, that's what the whole more plates, more dates thing was. He was looking at him like, Jesus Christ, this man, this man's insulin is, or oh, whatever, markers. He basically said he was pre-diabetic. I'm not going to pretend to know, but. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah it just depends. I, like, Just stop eating foods that 
spike your insulin yeah and like there's gonna be certain types of foods as well like a banana may not spike your insulin as much but it's it's pretty subjective to be honest you can do some of those food tolerance tests or those those um that Zoe thing. You seen that uh, with the blue cookies? That's a that's a bunch of shit. <laughs> that Zoe guy, Tim Speck, he's a fucking clown. Yeah. Uh, I would say, mate, try and lose some weight uh, for pre-diabetic. This is it's pretty limited knowledge for me. I don't know why I even asked the question. Shout out Ian Perkins. I'll ask him and then he'll come back to us. He's a clinical nutritionist. Great, what a man. Thanks, Ian. I'll ans- ask the next question or I guess I'll answer it. Gun. But I'll ask it as well. Uh... <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Tips to improve one's ability to maintain strength during long isometric effort. Go for it, Jeff. No, I was just going to ask that one, not answer it. Oh, you wanted to ask me? Yeah. Tips to improve one's ability to maintain strength during long isometric effort. I mean, Do tips. more isometric holds, Chief. Yeah. That's it, really. If you want to get better at something, just do it more often. That almost seems like the easiest one to train, surely isometric strength you just need to do more iso stuff it depends like what guys just remember if you want to get strong for jiu-jitsu the stuff that we do in the rate weights room rates room rapes room rates rapes room at best is going to have general strength adaptations so you don't want to mimic specific sport you can but mimicking specific movements that you do at jiu-jitsu in the weights room is a waste of time you just want to get strong through f- the correct movement patterns, you know, squat, deadlift, hinge, push, pull, k- like all that kind of shit we normally talk about. And we're just going to co- create general strength adaptations that's going to allow you to train for longer and harder on the mats and be more resilient to injury. So if you do want to get better at holding things isometrically or holding things for longer, then you need to practice isometric holds in the gym. E.g., mm. if you just want to be able to squeeze people, I, I mean, doing isometric holds may, it prob- it probably isn't the answer. Doing, getting your legs stronger, getting your back stronger through pull-ups, pull up, uh, pull-ups, rowing movements, Bulgarian split squats, single mm. leg movements, deadlift, squatting. That's probably going to have a better effect than just you know trying to squeeze a ball between Let's your legs. Let's put it this way: How much would just doing normal up and down squats translate to your wall sit? Heavily. Yeah. Probably not, no. No? No, not that much. Not as much as you think. So if you train the wall sit a lot, you could be like you could get like a woman in here who who just who fucking loves a wall sit. Obviously she'd be lighter. Lighter or a man, whatever. Yeah. Uh, versus someone who can squat really well but never trains the wall sit. And you could get that person to out wall sit that that the big squatter. The the basically a wall sit would be a fucking waste of time versus getting really good squat. Okay, fair. Get really good squat. Shout out Silvio. He has a fucking very good bo- um, body triangle from the back. Yeah, and he will. I've never, I've never programmed him an isometric hold. Never. Yeah, and he. I mean, he, he he's just got has good very Bulgarians. strong legs. He's got legs. good squats. He's got good deadlifts. He's been training for you know fifteen, twenty years, and he will fucking crush people in isometric holding positions. You'd be surprised how many legit competitors have come through and just been body trying to, to, to submission by Silvio. Yeah. Hilarious. He, he he is so fucking strong in that position and he never does any ISO holds. So just eats vegetables. He, vegetables. Vegetables. <laughs> Shout out Silvio. Here's where isometric holds are useful though, particularly if you have like an injury or some tendon injuries. They're a great, great way to stimulate some blood flow through the area by you know stimulating muscles around the joint and to get more blood flow through that area, which can help relieve pain symptoms and help you get on with your workout. E.g., yeah. if you've got a bit of a knee issue, again, subjective to the knee, in, uh, knee issue, start with some isometric holds on the leg extension, get the quads in a big pump, do, get the hamstrings in a big I pump. I do like the hamstring isos. Yeah, hamstring isos, get the hamstring nice and Love pumped, it. get the quad nice and pumped. It's very good for the knees. Very good. Very good. Very good Same for Same would knees. apply for some upper body movements as well. Uh, that's what isometrics uh, are useful. I wouldn't get bothered getting carried away thinking that it's going to translate to your time on the mats because it's fucking not. And if people say like, oh, isometric, fuck off. You heard it just here. Just fuck off. Just fuck off. If you're not going to enjoy it, just fuck off. Yeah. Right. Uh, tips for high tripod passing. Keep getting butterfly swept or people entering my legs. So I think you should switch between high tripod and different other kinds of camping. And I think if people are entering your legs, it means that you're losing head position momentarily. 
because basically if you put your head on someone's shoulder and it stays there there's no way that they can reach your leg basically so from a camping position yeah from a high tripod camp where you've got your head on their shoulder and your butt high up in the air and you maybe got a sea grip on the armpit or maybe you're grabbing behind their back it technically is impossible for them to get to your legs because they should be pinned down to the floor well yeah they can touch your leg but for them to physically move themselves over towards your leg like your head is in the way so if you're just putting your head there but you're not actually applying pressure through your toes into your head then that's a problem so you gotta like think head position isn't all it should be like the feeling of your head pressuring into someone's shoulder and you're always just like burying your head into their shoulder so if you feel like you can apply more pressure with your head you should probably do that in those sorts of positions because if you don't then they're going to start to like build momentum pushing and pulling you until they can displace your head and then then they can get to your legs then mm. they will get your legs my friend yeah. cool uh, i will carry on uh. uh talk to us about aiga so oh yeah give us some info this is going to be exciting. We've got a great team. Uh, Euro Trash, shout out all the gang. Uh, Jed, Mateusz Zizinski. Yeah. Do you want me to list everyone? We'll start with. Up to you. Ashley Williams, Sam McNally, Jed, Mateusz Zizinski, myself Stormzy, Marcin Matruljevic, and fuck this is why i didn't want to do it let me just check the phone quickly i knew this would happen anyway what's the date of aiga uh well, there's a plus 99 person that oh no, no that's uh that's that's thingy uh that's marching the so so let me let me repeat because obviously my memory is not what it once ever was so we have come on no, mate, it's not looking good breath. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, Shea Montague as well. Sorry, yeah, Shea Montague. That's the one. Shea is going to be our lightest competitor. He's an animal. He keeps winning shit. So, What's you know, his name, sir? Shea Montague. Yeah. Nice moustache. Oh, that fella, yeah. He's yeah. winning heaps of stuff, yeah. Yeah, Tiger King. Uh, that guy. Um, and, yeah, then we got our reserves as well. Sylvie's going to be on the reserves. So, yeah. hopefully, I mean, not hopefully he gets a match, but, you know, he could get a match and then it'd be entertaining to see Sylvie against some Dagestanis. I would fucking love that. I would love that uh, too. But, yeah, I mean... So the trials happen, there's like a Europe trials, which is going to happen in Turkey. There's a Brazil trials, a North America trials, or maybe two. Uh, and then there's another trials, whatever. But basically, then you go to the main competition. The main competition is a 500k cash prize. Second place is 300k. Third place is 150k. And then fourth place is 50k. So, And then, you, and then upon the, winning those matches, you go to the big match for a million bucks. No, Isn't no, it? I think there's just a million in prize total. Like it's 500 plus 300 plus oh, 150. Yeah. So the total is 1 million prize cash fund. Uh, fund, cash, whatever. Anyway, yeah, yeah. you get the idea. So all you have to do is come third or fourth. And like if you come fourth, you get seven grand each. Like the shoot, warlord shoot money. For, shoot for the first. I mean, shoot. aim for the stars, right? But whatever, we're going to land on the moon realistically. We, we don't have the juiciest team in the world. Shoot for the stars. Yeah. Shoot, aim for the, aim for the shooting and you'll land killing in the moon yes yes so that's it i mean and if you come third you get 20k each in your team and obviously you probably want to split it with your uh with your reserves as well so you give your reserves a little bit so but basically you're going to get 20 grand each for third place which is completely ridiculous compared to everything like i think adcc you get like 10k for your division they're just completely ridiculous. Anyway, so we're definitely going to do that. And hopefully we get first. Maybe we don't. Maybe we get second. Maybe we don't. But even if we get fourth, I will still be a very happy lad. Seven grand. Happy. Seven grand. <laughs> but you have to go to Kazakhstan, which is kind of a long way away. So you ha Owen hates traveling, but that will be a fun trip with the lads. I loathe traveling. But yeah, as long as there's other people to suffer with me, then it's okay. Yeah, you'll be fine, mate. Yeah, as long as I see We had a nice suffering. conversation on the plane. Talk, chat, chat. On the way back, fuck yeah. Fuck off if, right I, if I'm in on the way there again, fuck. Do you switch uh, up your pliers each session or do you block them? mate dyslexia do you switch c could you read this for me do you switch up your pliers each session or do you or do a block of the same ones for a certain time okay cool for the match strong program i do blocks of two weeks so you practice the same things for two weeks um for the fellas i have in person i like to change it each week although you may do, be doing the same thing um for two weeks back to back basically it doesn't matter too much 
Uh, we're all beginners at pliers, unless you come from a track and field background, then you're going to be an absolute fucking beast. But for most of us, we're all beginner uh, stages at pliers, so we just want to have... I was thinking with the hops, right? Every time I do the hops, I envisage doing a hurdle on one leg. Should we get some hurdles? Low level hurdles? Unnecessary. But could help with the techers. Potentially. You just need... But also just thinking about the technique. Like, can yeah. a, can aesthetically just get better at thinking about the technique of getting yeah. the knee up, hit, getting good ground contact. Um, you've gotten a lot better yeah. without hurdles, so we don't need to. Yeah, yeah, but it's in. good, easy cues, isn't it? Could be, yeah. What yeah. I do with my online guys is, what you don't want to do when you're doing pliers, especially a hop, is just feel like you're just scooting forward and not lifting the knee up, and it's just be very hippie, and you're just like moving to the end of the room. What you actually want to be doing is lifting that, that leg up and getting good. Bounce. Movement, knee flexion, movement through the hip. The hop is off a, off a one leg jump. It is the hardest jump to do because it just it's very it leaves you very vulnerable and there's nowhere to hide in a hopping motion. Do they throw in tuck jumps in that? Hop tuck tuck jumps. Tuck jumps, yeah. No, you what the 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 highest level you could go to is ping tier, and that's when you just have like okay. So basically, light tier you could do. Because it's a lower intensity, you could have more landings because it's not as intense. So you could go, you know, 10 to 20 landings mm. each leg on a, on a light tier. And then for a medium tier, you could go, you know, five to, no, probably like 10 to 20 landings. And then for a ping tier where you're absolutely, abs absolutely gunning for it at like 100% intensity, you probably look to like five to 10 landings each leg. We used to do a lot of tuck jumps that shoot like 30 seconds straight of just tuck jumping. Yeah, it's good. That, that's good. brutal. That's like a... Is that... That is pliers. What would that... It that is be pliers. D, MT. Uh, medium probably, tier. probably medium tier. Yeah, yeah. Medium tier. That was a good medium tier. I, I remember feeling a lot fitter having deep, done that. Yeah. Deep, deep tier is fantastic as yeah. well. We well, love the deep tier stuff. Really so cool. uh, I, I mix up... A, I, basically, I follow uh, Plus Pliers, Matt McInnes Watson's. I like to have a look at all of his programs. I go, hmm... What do I think is going to work best for my jiu-jitsu fellas? And, you know, I'll, I'll take some of the programs and implement that into what we're doing. And I'll just, you know, if if they've got like bounding and all that kind of stuff, I usually take out the bounding. It's not really, we don't need to get too good at bounding because we're not track and field athletes. So I'll chop and change some, some certain things. Uh, but yeah, you just want to go through a variety of jumps. I would say to, to master plyometrics, which is going to take a very long time to do, Get good at understanding how to pop off the floor and get really good at understanding how to hop off one leg and that will improve mm -hmm. your plyometric uh, progression. And also, Hops are hard. Hops are fucking hard and get really good at deep tier pliers, understanding how to yield and overcome. Yielding means getting into a deep stretch position and then overcoming that by getting back out of it. Sick. All right, last question because I've got to go. Okay. Are rolling back takes BS or legit? So basically... Ben Bolos, yeah. Base, I think the question is more, oh, if you're doing a forward roll, then you're already going to be in top position. So I would try to avoid those as much as possible. You can do them as counters to leg lock entries like quite well. That that would be the time where it's worth doing, right? If people keep doing loose leg lock entries and they're just spamming the leg lock entries, you're like, I keep having to like disengage and re-engage. Then, then I would start to look at the rolling back takes or like the, the stomp bolo type things. But in general, I will like it's hard to force a rolling back take, you know, like if someone curls up and kind of gives it to you and keeps trying to give it to you, then I would take it. But generally I think it's a safer option to just stay on top, try to get to mount and then force people to turtle or force people to go onto their front from the mounted position. Once you've already got the legs in your knees in place for the hooks. So rolling back takes are good, but it comes with a risk, right? If you, if you keep doing them too often, people start to predict it. And then a lot of the time you lose your top position and long run, you don't want to lose top position because people get more tired on the bottom. Fair play. That's enough, guys. Guys, remember, like, subscribe, YouTube, Spotify, do all that. Get our instructionals. You have three instructionals out. And a new one coming. Four. There'll be four instructionals. Yeah, I need a name, but fuck. Epstein's Island Leg Lock yeah. Edition is going to be what it's called. It's going to be really good. I've got an instructional coming out, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, check out the details below. Strength programs. You have a gym. I have a gym. Check out the links below. Good to see you. Christian has a new uh, clothing brand, oh, by the way. Oh, Crispy has a new, yeah, yeah, Crispy. Check it out for sure, yeah, yeah.